So pleased to have joining us all the way from the West Coast here in BC, two-time Olympian, fresh off her Canadian record setting of, uh, event here in Tokyo, Geneviève Lalande. Geneviève, how you doing? Pretty good. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, mm -hmm. pleasure to chat with you. Obviously been following your career here for a little bit uh, on the road and in the road races and obviously uh, a couple events here in the Olympics. Uh, but like you said, coming off uh, a big event here in Tokyo, the Olympics itself got pushed back a year due to COVID. Uh, wanted to ask you just your experience in traveling to the Olympics in China, you know, during a pandemic, and uh, if that extra year sort of helped uh, your preparation here for the Olympic Games. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was quite intense when they told us that, you know, first the, the, the Olympics would be, you know, no one knew whether they were going to be canceled, whether they were going to be postponed, but then they said, okay, they're going to be postponed. So um when they told us that i was like okay just keep training but i mean of course in the media everyone's talking about like are they actually going to happen and and as an athlete you kind of have to put that aside and just focus on okay what can i do on a day-to-day -day basis and yeah. talking with my team you know i have a number of coaches and uh, uh physical therapists and and sports psychologists that I work with and everyone's like, you know, we have to just kind of block all of that out, focus on Tokyo as being the primary objective, regardless of whether it goes ahead or not, but we need to be ready. Yep. And so heading into that, we, um, yeah, just kind of focus on what we could control and the, the events that I could get into and preparation for that. So one of the big things was that uh, you know I couldn't go to the states without coming back and having a quarantine, and because of the time uh, of our season, you know our seasons start in May and then go until August, so um, you only have so many weeks in there that you can compete in. So we actually focused on Canadian meets. Um, I raced here in BC um, three times before heading over to Quebec, racing another time, and then. Um, heading into a training camp in the States. But I knew as soon as I left home, um, I wasn't coming back until after the Olympics. <laughs> and so I had to a lot of things in my bags yeah. and uh, um, had to get, you know, everything really prepared because um, once I headed off, we were, we were heading towards the games. And so uh, I went to Quebec, ran our national championships, and then um, headed across the border to Flagstaff in Arizona, where I was based for about three weeks uh, before heading down to um, Japan, where we had a staging camp about two weeks before uh, the games. And all of that was, you know, you also have to consider not only COVID, but also the fact that we're heading into a climate that was extremely warm. So, I mean, my finals were happening in 40 degree weather and it's humid and hot and so uh, we had to be extremely prepared for that and um so in our staging camps you know it was all about just making sure that we were you know best prepared for the climate because um you know you want to get to your race and be able to perform and uh so we had a number of cooling techniques hydration techniques all of that on top of, you know, getting COVID tested every day and, uh, you know, having to get vaccinated within that and uh, um, just being as best prepared, being in these like quarantine bubbles. So we couldn't, we could just stay in our hotel and then go to training and then come back. Um, it was, yeah, it was intense. It was uh, thinking back on it all. It was, you know, a lot of procedures and a lot of organization, um, but ultimately, you know, it paid off and, uh, um, I was just so honored to be able to run, it, to, to have that opportunity, considering everything that was going on in the world. And still to this, this day, you know, anytime that I get a chance to hop on a plane and go to a race or whatnot, um, I consider the fact that, you know, how lucky am I that I'm able to do this and uh, um, considering the global pandemic <laughs> that we're going through. With, with all the obstacles you had to overcome just to get to the Olympics and uh, to train for Tokyo, you're able to, uh, I guess athletes, high performance athletes talk about peaking at the right time, peaking for competition. So you're able to basically set a personal best and then beat that personal best the day after in the finals, you know, setting a Canadian record at the, at the same time. So talk about being able to peak 
you know, at the height of performance, uh, not only once, but go ahead and beat that the, the day after, uh, being at your best performance, you know, even uh, more so than what you train for, uh, and being able to set that record. Yeah, that, I mean, that was a testament to, um, I guess, my athletic abilities, but also the training that we had put in and my yep. team that had supported me throughout all of that. And uh, we knew all along that the objective was Tokyo. There was no question about anything else. You know, we were heading towards Tokyo and that was what the goal was, was to perform in the semis and then also um, to perform in the finals. Because, I mean, you have to get to the finals to be in that race. <laughs> and uh, so we knew exactly what it took. Um, we, we had done the analysis. We knew what the time was that I needed to race. Um, and of course, there's also other criteria. So um, it's like top three in each races plus the next fast five fastest times. And uh, I so I knew exactly what I had to do in my race to uh, make it into the finals. And we had practiced that over and over again throughout the season, mimicking different scenarios and such. And uh, honestly, once I stepped on the onto the start line, I knew that I was ready and I was where I was supposed to be. And uh, we ran the race and um, who, uh, for anyone who watched it or, or for those who haven't watched it, I ran most of it kind of alone yeah. um, behind the leaders. But uh, it was um, my strategy heading in because I knew that those I knew that those girls were extremely fit and, you know, are some of the best in the world. So I knew that they were going to want to run as fast as they could to get into the final. But I knew that I needed to conserve some of my energy heading into the final. So, yeah, we planned on on the splits. And, and of course, we've got clocks around the track um, telling us what we're running. So um, I hit pretty much every target heading into uh, into that race and and, um, and then crossed the line and and just hoped that that was enough to make me to get me into the final and that, um, you know, the other races weren't going to go as fast as that one. And uh, of course, I was um, one of the first ones to qualify for the finals off of time. So um, that was pretty exciting. And then heading into the finals, honestly, at that point, you just take everything you've got and put it into that race. And uh, so, yeah, as I said, we used all of the cooling techniques. I was, you know, piling ice on top of me after the race, eating as much as I could, um, you know, getting to bed right away so that I could be well rested for the finals. Um, and uh, all of that paid off because, yeah, I was able to, to run another personal best. Uh, the race was a lot different. It was way more tactical and bunched up and crowded. But um, ultimately, you know, I was just, again, so happy to be able to race and uh, really happy with my results. So. Yeah, well, well that, yeah. <laughs> that's what I wanted to ask you as well. Obviously, the 3,000-meter steeplechase, uh, your event here in the Olympics. Uh, but like you said, how much strategy is involved in preparing for that race, not only the quarterfinals, but going into the final, like you said, when the gun goes off, do you just, you know, gun it and give it all you got coming out of the boot? Or are you, uh, like, trying to conserve some energy, you know, to, to make up uh, some ground later on in the, in the second or third lap? Yeah, I mean, well, it's not a sprint, but it is, you know, for, for most people, they would see me going and would be would thinking that I'd be running full out. But, uh, um, of course, you know, we do have some strategies heading into it. You have a plan A all the way to plan Z. Um, as to how the race is going to go, and sometimes it nothing of the combination. And uh, I think in this case, it was a bit of a variety of all kinds of different scenarios. And um, so, yeah, heading into the race, you know, you don't prepare to like run all out from the gun, but uh, you do have to settle into that pack as, as quickly as possible yeah. and uh, try and maintain, you know, connection with the leaders and uh, stay as close as you can and um, also get over barriers and, and run through the water pit. So, um, yeah, there is definitely strategy as to, like, what place you want to be in and where you want to be situated. Um, some of the things that I did okay but not great. So uh, I think the best part of that is I finished the race being satisfied with it. And like you said, you had mentioned earlier, uh, getting your rest was important. I would seen a piece where some of the beds in the Olympic Village were basically cardboard beds. So I wanted to ask you what it was like, uh, I guess, uh, bunking down here on a piece of cardboard. Obviously, it didn't hurt the results here. You're in some of your best times uh, of your career. But uh, what was that experience like sort of when you saw the, uh, uh, I guess, the uh, facilities for the evening? Yeah, where we were going to sleep. Um, 
Yeah, they were definitely made out of cardboard and plastic. <laughs> um, I'm not going to lie. It did kind of look like you were sleeping on a bed of recycled plastic water bottles if you like really <laughs> looked under and saw what you were sleeping on. Um, uh, they were okay. They were not anything special. Let's just say that when I came home, I was very happy to sleep in my own bed but uh, um you know for for the games that's that's what you hear you're meant to expect you know everyone's yeah. sleeping on the same thing so yeah. uh you just kind of have to get used to it but yes we did uh, manage to find as some of my roommates left we managed to like grab some of their extra padding mm -hmm. to make them a little bit more comfortable <laughs> yeah think, things you gotta do in competition yeah uh, yeah, I, I guess I wanted to ask you too. I mean, uh, sort of growing up a bit in Moncton here, what uh, what sort of gets you into running, uh, sort of as a young girl, uh, coming up here in uh, in New Brunswick? Oh man, so many things. Um, yeah, I so I started running actually just because my brother was training for hockey, and uh, right at the um, there's a gravel track behind the old Mon Moncton High School. Yep. And um, they were doing dry land training, and uh, I got I got brought tagged along because it was the younger sister, and um, I started running with the with the hockey guys, and I asked my parent, my dad, if that was okay, and said, if sure, if this young girl is, wants to go running with the, with the with the hockey team, sure, go ahead. And um, I thought it was great because you know I could try and chase after after the hockey player and, and um turns out once you start catching them it's not so cool for your older brother so um yeah so then you know my parents put me into all kinds of different sports growing up and uh you know i played basketball i played soccer i uh danced for a while and um really tried to do kind of all all kinds of different physical activities mostly because i had a lot of energy and, yeah. and they needed to keep me controlled but um yeah, I did all kinds of things, and um, alongside that, I also ran the like regional cross country races for for my schools and stuff. But yeah. um, to be honest, I didn't really think much more of the fact that I did enjoy running as a part of all of these things. And uh, I was that kid who, you know, when they gave suicides to, I was like, "Yes, yeah. this is my time to shine." <laughs> um, but. Uh, um, Inevitably, you know, I, that kind of led me to uh, joining um, Le Club Bleu, which was a group of, you know, younger athletes, part of the University of Moncton team. And uh, through that, you know, I found um, different coaches, including Gabriel Leblanc and then Gilles Camo, and then he led me to Joël Bourgeois. So, um, you know, I got to run with the university team at, while I was in high school. And uh, with like Patty Blanchard and, and um, that crew. So I then was kind of exposed to this whole different world of running and where it could lead me to. And um, I thought it was so exciting that I could go and do these competitions in different places, you know, in New Brunswick with Leger de l'Acadie and such. And then also across Canada with like, you know, our national championships and things. And so. Uh, for me, I just thought it was a great way to travel. And um, so then I started, you know, started training with this group and had so much fun and, and just kind of found this passion for the sport that uh, um, to this day still exists. And I still get excited when I get to go run with, the, you know, the university teams and such, such things. But uh, uh, for the most part now, it's just become part of my life. And, and it is something that I will continue to do regardless of whether I'm training for the Olympics or not. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you taking some time for us. want to wish you all the best uh, competing, getting ready for uh, Paris 2024, and uh, hope to see you back on the East Coast here sometime in the summer.